Hello everyone, Seamus here, and in this video I will be attempting to repair this incredibly interesting Japanese PC, the Fujitsu FM Towns. I had actually learned about the FM Towns a number of years ago. Essentially, it was the first computer ever manufactured to include a CD-ROM drive. It also ran its own proprietary library of software, including a sizable library of arcade-style games. After reading about it, I knew I had to find one, but unfortunately it was never actually sold outside of Japan, so coming across one in the wild here in Atlantic Canada is next to impossible. So to the internet we go! On eBay, the few that are available are sold at outrageous prices. It's sort of an odd situation though, these computers technically aren't rare, but there are very few people who are interested in them, so these sellers take advantage of the small market and sell these machines at an absurd markup. So I turn to Yahoo Auctions Japan, via the services of Baiyi, where the market is a lot better. One day in May of 2020, I was browsing through listings and I found one at an asking price of about $80, which was pretty reasonable. The item's condition said it was junk, but experience tells me that that means that they didn't bother testing it before setting it out for sale. So I said, what the heck, place my bid, and won. To ensure the machine arrives safely, I chose C shipping, which cost about an additional $100. In mid-August, the package finally arrived. It came in this nondescript cardboard box. Opening it up reveals that the seller had used Japanese newspapers as packing material. How fascinating. The computer itself, thankfully, is enveloped in bubble wrap. Freeing the machine from its wrapped enclosure, we can get a sense of its condition. Compared to the photos from the website, it appears that the machine, to much relief, hasn't been damaged in transport. But with that said, this machine is hardly perfect cosmetics-wise. Some of the paint appears to be rubbed off and scratched in places, a lot of the metal pieces like the rear expansion covers, some of the screws, and the SCSI Terminator have rusted. On the inside, there's a huge spot of rust that's even made its way onto the plastic panel. And this machine is generally very dirty all around. Now, much of this is manageable, but I think I'm going to have to live with those paint imperfections, as I really don't want to have to completely redo all of the paint, especially with these painted on details. I was considering attempting to touch it up with model paint as close to the original color as possible, but I haven't done anything like that yet. If any of you viewers have any ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. So before we get started cleaning it up, we should probably give it a test to see if it works. Interestingly, on the back there are these metal rods stuck into the screw holes on the monitor port. They're blocking the connector, so I removed them with pliers. I wonder how they got there though, did somebody just pull a cable out so hard that it broke, leaving the thumb screws behind? Weird. FM Towns uses a DB15 RGB monitor connector, just like older Apple Macintosh computers, so I'm going to try to connect it to a VGA monitor using an adapter designed for the Macintosh. I've plugged it into power and hooked up my favorite little Philips CRT monitor. I don't currently own a keyboard for the FM Towns or any of the other peripherals. So let's see, pressing the power button and nothing. No signs of life. Not even the fan is running. At least it didn't blow up though. So let's see what's wrong. Initially, it seems that opening an FM Towns is quite easy with the toolless removable side panel, but things quickly take a turn for the weird when you realize the computer has no visible screws holding it together. There seem to be very few, if any, videos on YouTube of people disassembling an FM Towns. And thanks for nothing, I fix it. So, naturally, I recorded it. But not very professionally. I'd sort of just propped up the camera while I worked. The result isn't great. I was also watching a television show on my laptop while I went about, and didn't realize it was in the shot in some of the clips. So to avoid copyright issues, I placed a black square over it where appropriate. Sorry about all of this. 
hopefully you can get a sense as to how to disassemble the machine. As you're about to see, it's not for the faint of heart, and frankly, I did not want to record it a second time. This honestly has to have been one of the most difficult shot-in-the-dark computer repairs I've ever performed. I did pretty much all of this disassembly in the completely wrong order, but for your sake as a viewer, I've put these clips in more or less the correct order as to give you the best possible instructions, but I hope you will excuse any weird inconsistencies. Alright, off we go. Before we disassemble this machine, I'll unplug the SCSI terminator and unscrew the three rear slot covers. These will be receiving rust treatment. Now we'll remove the side panel. Just click down these two releases and the side panel can be hinged off. Inside we can see one of the motherboards. Yes, this machine has two motherboards. The only components on the board I can recognize are these three SIM slots and the 16 MHz Intel 8386 DX processor. Everything else is made up of likely proprietary Fujitsu ICs. If even one of those is bad, we are probably screwed. Next, use a screwdriver to pry open these two top covers. One is for the IC card slot, and the other disguises a screw. Remove the screw. With that screw removed, we can take off the plastic surround on the floppy drives. I'm also going to go ahead and remove the upper plastic trim on the machine by pressing on this tab and lifting it away. To remove the floppy drives, press down on the two tabs and pull the drive straight out. What strikes me as impressive about this machine is its lack of cables. There are only three of them. Everything slots into this mid-plane board here. It's a design you would associate more with server or workstation machines, indicating how upscale this computer was. This space-efficient design is how the machine is so small compared to other PCs of its era. Once we've removed the disk drives, remove this screw right below where the drive sat. On the inside of the machine, remove this metal bracket that holds the CD-ROM drive cable, and disconnect it from the mid-plane. Press outwards on this large yellow tab. With this, the CD-ROM drive and front fascia can be slid out of the machine. Next, we'll want to remove the back panel. Press N on these tabs, and this side of the panel can be swung out and removed. Now we can remove the other side panel. First, go inside the case and disconnect the clock battery and reset cables from the mid-plane. Bonus marks to Fujitsu for mounting the clock battery separate from the motherboard, so it wouldn't be damaged if the battery were to leak. This battery looks fine, so I'm going to leave it in here at least for now. Now press down on the three tabs on the top of the system and rotate the panel away. Remove these two screws on the inside and take out this bar. On the rear of the system, use a flathead screwdriver to unclip the fan bracket. Unplug the fan from the power supply. Finally, we are able to remove the power supply and motherboards. Simply pull them out from the back. Once we've got them out, we can detach the power supply from the motherboard simply by pushing it forward, away from the rear ports. I went ahead and disassembled the power supply. Unfortunately, I lost all of my footage of this. But it only takes a few screws to take apart. Interestingly, on a machine seemingly made entirely by Fujitsu, the power supply was actually manufactured by TDK. This makes the power supply the only component in this entire computer that was outsourced. I took a look at the power supply, and something caught my eye immediately. All of these resistors near where the power comes into the system have blown up. They are really just piles of rust at this point, and the color codes are completely illegible. To my amazement, I happened to stumble across a forum post describing this exact problem with another FM Towns machine. I assume this must be a common problem or something. Even better, another user commented on the post with a list of most, if not all, of the resistor and capacitor values needed for this power supply. Awesome! Once I found all the required resistor values, I immediately ordered replacements, and they arrived within the week. And now, time for the most dangerous thing a YouTuber can do. Soldering on camera. I had to do this at a pretty weird angle to accommodate the camera, and combined with my self-taught soldering skills, let's just say I'll be getting some comments. We'll begin by desoldering the old resistors, and if there's a need for more evidence that these resistors need replacement, when I applied even the slightest bit of heat from the iron, they completely disintegrated into a mess of rust. The specific resistors that needed replacing were R3, R6, R7, R8, R9, 
R10, and R17. The resistor number is indicated by the silk screening on the PCB. Just match it with the value chart and install the appropriate component. We'll take the replacement resistor and bend its legs 90 degrees so it can fit into the holes. Once it's in, I'll bend them outwards to stop it from falling off of the board. We'll do this with each resistor, double-triple checking the correct values are in the correct positions. Once they're in, we can solder them into place, then cut off the ends of the legs. And there they are. Looks as good as new. Before I reassemble the power supply, I quickly went through all of my new solder joints with my multimeter to check continuity, and to ensure I didn't cross any traces that shouldn't be, and indeed, they all seem to be good. Turning our attention away from the power supply for the moment, I treated all of the plastic pieces to a gentle scrub, and it cleaned them up pretty nicely. As for the rusted metal bits, first I tried submerging the smaller pieces in white vinegar. This didn't really work well, so I moved to a different solution. I just happened to be in the city, so I went into Lee Valley and picked up some Evapo Rust. I've seen this product in some videos on YouTube and figured I'd give it a try. I set up a plastic container in my basement and poured the solution in, followed by all the pieces. I also threw in this SCSI terminator. As for the large frame, there isn't enough liquid to submerge it all at once, so I treated it one part at a time, making sure to rotate it every few hours to target each affected area. So here's the final result on the frame. All of the rust has completely disappeared. You may notice, however, that the finish of where it's been treated no longer matches the rest of the piece. This is to be expected, as the rust took it away, not the rust remover. I don't really care about the finish, as these components aren't usually visible, and anyway, what's most important is that the rust doesn't spread, especially into the computer itself. The expansion port covers and the SCSI terminator is more of the same. Overall, I'm very impressed with the Evaporust product. It effectively neutralized all of the rust from the components, and I won't hesitate to use it again in future projects. Unfortunately, however, here in Canada at the least, it seems to be a little expensive. These two small jugs cost something like 35 bucks, but as I said, it works very well, so it's probably worth it. So, after replacing the resistors in the power supply, and thoroughly cleaning and de-rusting the case, I put the machine back together off-camera. Just follow the same steps in reverse and you should get it together pretty well with a little bit of patience. That doesn't mean it's easy or anything, but the computer is actually designed to conceivably be taken apart, repaired or upgraded, and put back together. Which is more than can be said about some of Apple's more impressive feats of industrial design prowess. Let's try a second test. And wow! It seems to work. The fan runs, indicators light up, and the drives even seek. But it seems something is wrong. Nothing appears on the monitor. After some research, I came to the conclusion that I'm a bit of a bonehead. As it turns out, the FM Town's monitor port, despite using the same DB15 connector, is completely incompatible with that of the Macintosh, and therefore my adapter. In retrospect, I have no idea why I ever thought otherwise. So I went online and ordered this special cable from eBay for about $50. It arrived a few weeks later. It looks very homemade, but on one end you've got the DB15, and on the other end your standard VGA port. You may now think, oh yeah, there we go, we can connect it to a monitor. But not so fast. The FM Towns is one of those retro machines that outputs a 15 kHz horizontal sync signal. This significantly narrows the amount of monitors you can use with this machine, as many monitors, at least those sold in North America, simply don't support it. Of all the different monitors I own, the only one that's truly compatible is my Acer V236HL widescreen display, which I use with my everyday computer. One interesting little bit that I noticed about this monitor that I don't think I'd get around to mentioning otherwise, um, as you can see, this monitor displays the new Acer logo, which they adopted around 2011. I believe they were going through some sort of um, corporate restructuring at the time. But if we go into the monitor's settings, and into this 
menu, the empowering technology menu, which allows you to change the picture, you'll notice that the icon uh, uses the old cursive E from their old logo and the empowering uh, technology slogan, uh, which they stopped using after 2011. So likely, they just stuck the new logo on the monitor when they rebranded without changing the, any, of the, any of the internal bits. These types of monitors aren't the greatest for vintage computers, but it's good to know that this is an option though, as these displays are pretty dirt cheap. Alternatively, you can also use a device like this, which multiplies the 15 kilohertz to 31 kilohertz, easily displayed by any monitor. I'm probably going to end up going down that route eventually, so I can use a proper CRT with this, but for now, our Acer will work just fine. I went ahead and connected the video cable to the back of the machine, and the VGA into my monitor. Here we go! Pushing the power. And wow, there it is! It's working! I honestly can't believe it. The message across the bottom left says something along the lines of, Insert System Disk. On the right, you can tell it's cycling through all sorts of different storage devices looking for an operating system. The FM Towns was an interesting case in that its games actually shipped on bootable CDs. Floppies and hard drives were not required in order to boot the system and run applications, so I went ahead and burned a copy of Afterburner, which came out along with the system back in 1989. I inserted the disk and it began to load. This is a single speed drive, so it's not the fastest. And then this happened. Illegal CD. That's odd. CDRs didn't exist back in 1989, so how it knows that this is an illegal copy? I have no idea. Maybe the burn is slightly corrupted, so I tried to burn a different image of the game using a different application. This actually worked, and the game booted up, confirming that our CD-ROM drive works. That's wonderful, because finding a functional replacement would probably be a nightmare. The graphics of this game seem fairly impressive for the time. This is the farthest I'll be able to go without the accessories, unfortunately, but this is definitely a result I'm satisfied with. When this machine arrived, it was completely dead. Now it works and is able to load software. And all with very little technical information for this machine at all. I'll definitely need to look into getting a keyboard, mouse, and maybe even a controller to explore this machine further. And when I do, you bet I'll make another video. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.